As you traverse the desolate landscape, a soft breeze stirs the air, carrying with it an unsettling scent, a mixture of decay and something alien. Suddenly, your foot strikes something soft and moist, causing you to stumble. You recoil in horror as you realize you've stepped on a pulsating mass of strange, spore-like pods. In an instant, the delicate membrane ruptures, releasing a cloud of particles that swirl around you, infiltrating your nostrils and mouth, burrowing into your skin. At first, you feel nothing. Then, a creeping sense of unease washes over you. Soon, your veins are set ablaze with an agonizing heat, and your muscles begin to twitch involuntarily. Your joints stiffen, making every movement excruciating. Progressively, your body is betraying you. As the infection seeps into your cells, you sense a foreign presence probing the depths of your consciousness, sifting through your thoughts, memories, and emotions. Your identity is slowly being eroded, replaced by an insatiable hunger that commands your every action. You gaze down at your trembling hands. Your once familiar skin is now a grotesque, mottled canvas. Tendrils of foreign tissue snake their way through your body, binding with your flesh, turning it into a monstrous amalgamation of organic matter. Through the haze of pain and confusion, you become aware of a dark intelligence guiding your actions, a twisted, malevolent sentience that has taken root within your mind. It speaks in whispers, a cacophony of voices stolen from countless victims echoing in the very depths of your being. Now, you are one of just many instruments orchestrated by this organism's compound intelligence. Your individuality is swallowed whole by the collective, your life now merely a drop in the ocean of the Flood's unfathomable existence. Even today, the origin of Inferi Redivivus is draped in mystery. Unlike other forms of life in this and other galaxies, we cannot trace a lineage back through Eon's past, and the Flood cannot be neatly categorized according to taxonomical convention. What we do know has been passed down through countless generations, tales that tell of an ancient race so technologically advanced that even now, their relics border on the supernatural. In that time, beings of incomprehensible form watched over the universe, poised over the life that sprouted from it like seeds thrown to the wind. These beings, unrestricted by any particular physical form, assumed the role of galactic guardians, uplifting countless worlds and themselves partaking in a constant flux of death and rebirth. These, of course, were the precursors, enigmatic, transcendent beings that gave rise to both humanity and the Forerunners, an ancient and eventually rival species to our own. Jealous of a preference given to humanity by the Precursors, the Forerunners turned on their makers, resulting in their near annihilation. Most of those Precursors who survived underwent a process we have little hope of ever understanding. They reduced their unknowable forms into their constituent parts, becoming essentially little more than molecular dust contained in capsules. The Precursors were no strangers to a kind of shape-shifting, and it was their intention to reform into their previous selves at some point in the distant future. Over the course of millions of years, however, this dust degraded, failing to reconstitute the Precursors as planned. Instead, it induced insanity and grotesque mutations in any life forms that came in contact with it. It was this aberrant form that would later come to be known as the Flood. Indeed, the once benevolent precursors had refused to accept failure and extinction. They viewed the Flood form as a tool to unify the galaxy and exact retribution on the Forerunners for their defiance. Resolving that their creations would never again rise against them, the precursors determined that all life would be stripped of free will and assimilated into a single entity. It would be a full 10 million years after the Forerunners' extermination of the precursors before humanity's burgeoning interstellar empire would encounter the precursor dust. And over several centuries, this insidious substance would mutate rapidly, each generation a sacrifice to the ultimate goal of becoming the Flood form with which we are now all too familiar. Tragically, the truth of the Flood's genetic assault on humanity was obscured until it was far too late to make a difference. 
The details of this evolution spans both galaxies and millennia, and is far too complex to recount here. Suffice it to say, the Flood now exists as an ever-present threat, an unrelenting force that seeks only to consume. Yet, by usurping the biology, will, and even consciousness of its hosts, Inferi Redivivus also brings a twisted transformation, all in pursuit of the goal held by the Precursors themselves, unity no matter the cost. Now, however, we will shift our focus from history to biology. Indeed, despite the intrinsic horror it represents, Inferi Redivivus is a trove of biological wonder. As with many widespread infections within a population, the process of planetary domination occurs in stages, each one gradually building on the last and progressing from mindless assault to sophisticated strategy. But to truly understand this insidious organism, we need to take a step back. You see, at the core of the Flood's power is a single, unassuming cell, often referred to as the Flood Supercell, or FSC. Upon entering the host's body, usually via a previously infected sapient organism or a spore, the Flood Supercell begins the process of assimilation by integrating itself into the host's cells, a point to which we'll return. As I hope is apparent by now, the work of cataloging histories, species, and events from regions across the galaxy is a monumental effort, and I am not alone. Writers, video game designers, and dungeon masters often create their own fantastic worlds, each populated with creatures, people, and cultures all their own. The problem is, as with life, as these worlds grow, it can be difficult to keep track of everything. But with World Anvil, even the most complex world building is a breeze. With its robust tools, you can write up detailed accounts for each of your species, races, and regions, and use the built-in auto-linker function to keep track of how they relate to or descend from one another. Or you can start by importing a detailed map, and then link each of your species' profiles to their geographic location, making it easy to visualize your creation from a planetary view. Plus, World Anvil is always adding new features. One of their more recent features is called Chronicles, which takes some aspects of one of my favorite features, the Timeline Creation Tool, and allows you to connect important events with their location on a map. You can even link articles such as your species profiles to these world events and their locations, which can take your creation from a dull sequence of events to a living, breathing, fully interconnected world. And once you've forged your fantasy, sci-fi, or spec evo world, all of your entries are completely searchable. Gone are the days of documents and scattered folders. With World Anvil, the only thing holding you back is your own imagination. So if you want to try out World Anvil for yourself, just visit worldanvil.com and enter code THOUGHTPOTATO at checkout for a whopping 40% off an annual plan. So whether you're a novelist, a dungeon master planning your next campaign, or looking to create an alien planet, if you've had an idea for a world building project and just haven't figured out where to start, check out World Anvil today and get started. Links are in the description. Once inside the host cell, the Flood Supercell initiates a series of cellular changes by introducing its own genetic material into the host's genome, a mechanism not unlike those employed by retroviruses like HIV. But perhaps the most unsettling and ultimately most effective aspect of the Flood Supercell is its ability to integrate genetic material from host organisms. This mechanism is poorly understood, but it likely involves a reverse transcription of host RNA and subsequent integration into the Flood's genome. This horizontal gene transfer-like process enables the Flood Supercell to acquire host-specific genetic information, facilitating the manipulation of the host's cellular machinery and rapid adaptation to the host's immune system. On Earth, horizontal gene transfer can be observed in Agrobacterium, a genus known for their ability to transfer DNA to host plant cells by this very process. A portion of the Agrobacterium's tumor-inducing plasmid is transferred into the the host cell's genome, resulting in the expression of genes that promote the formation of plant tumors called crown galls. In turn, these tumors provide a nutrient-rich environment for the bacteria. But while the process observed in agrobacterium is similar in some aspects, in terms of all-encompassing systemic changes, nothing can compare to the flood supercell. Indeed, it is often described as thinking muscle, in that, in terms of its physical structure, it closely resembles both neurons and glial cells. As you likely already know, neurons are the primary functional units of the nervous system, specialized for the reception, processing, and transmission of information through electrical and chemical signaling. Glial cells, on the other hand, are non-neuronal cells that provide support and protection to neurons, playing a critical role in maintaining homeostasis and ensuring proper neuronal function. It is the FSC's unique protonaceous material and its capacity to self-assemble into a wide range of shapes and structures that enable it to mimic the properties of both cell types. 
For instance, the FSC has been observed to adopt neuronal-like characteristics by forming elongated, axon-like projections that allow it to produce ion channels and other membrane proteins that facilitate the transmission of electrical signals, similar to the action potentials generated by neurons. This similarity to neurons serves another function as well. It is able to integrate itself into the host's neuronal circuits by forming connections with the host's neurons. By doing so, the FSC can intercept and manipulate the host's neural communication, inducing behavioral changes and impairing the host's cognitive functions in order to facilitate its infection strategy. All of these adaptations enable the cell to form interconnected networks capable of rapid information processing and coordination, eerily similar to a neuronal network. And it doesn't stop there. The FSC occasionally exhibits glial-like properties by providing structural support and protection to the flood biomass, similar to the roles of astrocytes and oligodendrocytes in the nervous system. Of course, any invader to the host's body must contend with the immune system, but the flood's infection strategy is ruthlessly efficient, aggressive, and adaptive, allowing it to subvert the host organism's defenses with astonishing ease. Its ultimate goal, assimilation, occurs through a multitude of increasingly disturbing biological mechanisms, though even now we still have much to learn. Upon entering a host, flood supercells multiply extraordinarily rapidly, often overwhelming the host's immune defenses through sheer numbers. This high rate of replication allows the flood to hijack the host's cells, converting them into flood biomass so quickly that the immune response has little hope of overcoming it in the first place. But it doesn't stop there. In its quest to overwhelm its host's immune systems, the FSC also employs a number of more aggressive methods. First, the FSC releases immunosuppressive proteins that not only interfere with the host's cytokine synthesis, directly affecting the ability of immune immune cells to respond to a threat, but also disrupt the immune cell's signaling pathways, including those that bind to T-cell receptors, blocking their interaction and preventing effective immune cell communication. Second, the FSC utilizes specific receptor proteins to recognize cell surface markers on nearby host cells. These proteins, lipids, or carbohydrates present on the surface of cells, normally playing crucial roles in cell recognition, signaling, and immune response. By identifying these markers and expressing its own receptor proteins, the flood supercell is able to target specific cell types, bind to the cell surface marker, and initiate the process of both infection and assimilation. Though this process is disturbing, it is not without precedent. Earth-based pathogens such as viruses and bacteria often use cell surface markers to recognize and infect host cells. For an example, we can look once again to HIV, the virus responsible for AIDS, which recognizes and binds to the CD4 receptor on the surface of certain immune cells, allowing the virus to enter and infect the host cell. Finally, the very process of assimilating the host's cells and genetic material allows the FSC to incorporate the host's cellular signaling pathways into its own biology. This integration allows the supercell to respond to host-derived signals and differentiate accordingly, adapting to the needs of the flood collective and the host's environment. In many ways, this ability to differentiate is analogous to the pluripotency of stem cells in the human body, which can give rise to various cell types to serve specific functions. Indeed, in fairy red avivus, is nothing if not adaptable. The process of infecting, overwhelming, and assimilating begins in the individual, but eventually, its all-encompassing mission to consume is reflected across entire star systems. Previously, I briefly mentioned the flood spore, a passive transmission vector that is little more than a cluster of supercells floating aimlessly on the wind. Upon contact with a potential host organism, the spores release a potent cocktail of enzymes and signaling molecules that compromise the host's cellular integrity, allowing the flood's genetic material to infiltrate the host's cells. This insidious process of infection is facilitated by the spore's ability to alter their surface proteins and adhere to a wide variety of host cell types, a testament to their terrifying adaptability. Depending on the stage of the flood invasion, the host may be effectively transformed into a flood factory as the host's cellular machinery is hijacked and repurposed to produce more flood spores and infection forms, and ultimately resulting in the complete assimilation of the host organism. This transformation is a horrifying spectacle, as the host's very essence is consumed and entirely repurposed. But while this method can begin the infection of an entire species, spores are typically only produced by an established flood colony. For an unsuspecting world, the flood pod infectors, a larger and more complex infection agent, are the primary means through which the flood propagate their infection. Indeed, the infection process orchestrated by the pod infector is a highly sophisticated and brutal assault on the host's body. 
involving multiple stages that lead to a terrifying transformation. At roughly three and a half feet tall and averaging 50 pounds in weight, these small, weak creatures rely on their overwhelming numbers to attack potential hosts. Upon identifying a suitable host, the pod infector leaps toward the victim's chest area with remarkable precision. Utilizing its numerous tentacle-like limbs, the pod infector adheres to the host, rasping away at any protective layers, be it armor, clothing, or flesh, in a relentless attempt to gain access to the host's body. Once the pod infector successfully breaches the host's external defenses, its barbed appendages penetrate deep into the host's body. Guided by an innate biological imperative, these tentacles seek out the spinal cord, where an array of smaller tendrils establish a direct connection with the host's nervous system. The host is forced to endure this excruciating process with little hope of rescue. But while the physical pain is unimaginable, the neural subjugation orchestrated by the pod infector is arguably a more profoundly invasive and disturbing process. Once the pod infector's tentacles penetrate the host's spinal cord, they swiftly establish a direct neural interface. Once again, the methods by which this process occurs are not fully understood, but it appears that by employing specialized neuroreceptor proteins, the pod infector mimics the host's own neurotransmitters, enabling it to integrate its invasive signals into the host's nervous system. All all without triggering an immune response. The pot infector then rapidly decodes the host's unique neural patterns, analyzing the intricate web of electrical impulses that define the host's thoughts, emotions, and memories. In mere moments, the pot infector's invasive signals become indistinguishable from the host's own neural activity. This fusion of parasite and host enables the pot infector to exert complete control over the host's motor functions, cognitive processes, and other aspects of consciousness, effectively erasing the host's identity and autonomy. With its control over the host now firmly established, the pod infector burrows deeper into the body, displacing internal organs and nesting within the chest cavity or an anatomically equivalent space, and may remain there indefinitely, directing its host like a grotesque puppet. But while this entire process is horrifying, the flood is not content to reign over a multitude of puppets. As the pod infector takes control of its host's nervous system, it simultaneously releases a torrent of encapsulated flood supercells into the host's bloodstream. As described previously, these virulent cells interface with the host's own cells, initiating a process of rapid digestion and conversion. One by one, the host's cells are, in essence, methodically broken down and reconstructed as new flood cells. All that remains is a monstrous shell devoid of humanity, and in the final moments of this gruesome process, the host's body is often reshaped and repurposed into a lethal weapon. But for now, dear traveler, this is where the first part of our catalog ends. In the next phase, we will delve into the Flood's even more highly specialized forms, including an intelligence so vast it could only be composed of thousands of stolen thoughts and memories. Until then, tread carefully, and remember, you matter.